I have just played for you Greek's Arietta, the magnificent first piece that he wrote in his lyric pieces. He wrote 66 of these pieces. Throughout his lifetime, he loved the form of the small miniature. And Arietta is so special in Greek's heart. It's a love letter. It's an outpouring of love and tenderness that he had when he wrote this with his Nina in mind, his beautiful Nina who he married the next year. At least that's my interpretation. How can you not hear love in this piece? What you also hear in this piece is the essence of tension and release. Inhale and exhale, the ebb and flow of life. And you hear four-part writing. We're going to explore all of this. I would say that this is an intermediate level piece and there's no better time. The sooner you can learn about these elements and put them in your playing, the better. So let's listen to how Greg puts aria which is a song, a little song, Arietta, into motion. He takes a melody and starts by repeating that same pitch five times. Very unusual to start a piece like that. This piece is in E flat major. It's your tonality and your scale. is tonic, the one, the G is the third scale degree, and the B flat is the dominant fifth scale degree. Now, imagine that you are in a composition class, and the assignment is you need to start the first beat of the piece using only the three notes of the triad. What would you do? Greek does start with that E flat and then instead of this G here he moves this G up one octave up two octaves that's the third scale degree up here and finally your dominant is here so this is what you hear at the opening what does that do for you? And the five notes, and then on the fifth one. Already, we're in another world. And the repetition now on the F, five of these Fs. Underneath that, under the soprano and above the bass, we have the tenor part that does this. It stays on this minor third and expands out to the fourth again. The alto above goes up a half step. These are all minor thirds. Put these together, we have the consonances in measure one and the dissonance in measure two. Measure three is still dissonant. And measure four resolves to consonants. How imaginative to start with this consonance and two measures of dissonance and then consonants. Continuing with the single line of the melody and a little rep variation here. What key is that? I'm not sure it's 
tones. Sure sounds like E flat major to me. What is the alto doing there? You guessed it. It's holding. It's holding the E flat tonality. That's all the alto does there. Left hand with the tenor and the bass, and that's why I'm saying this is a study in four part writing. Instead of our pitch that we had at the beginning, notice that this E flat in the bass holds. balancing to get the E flat that's sustained for two full measures a little louder than the accompanying broken fourths above in the tenor and this augmented second. I did a lot of this to get a perfect placement. Now I'm trying to replicate, replicate that that I just did with two hands as redistribution, all with the left hand. This takes a lot of control, which now turns it into not an intermediate piece, but an advanced piece. I get asked so often, what's the level of this piece? And I give you the easy answer to learn the notes. It's an intermediate level. To play it magnificently and artistically, it's a lifetime. Well, here we are now, this left hand again. I'm spending a lot of time on the first four measures because of the template for the entire piece. Breathe. Always before you start, breathe. How do you pick a tempo? You hear it in your head before you play. So for me, I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing the speed of the 16th note inner voice. Yada di da, yada di da, yada di da, yada di da. I'm also hearing yada di da, di da. And when I get the right balance between those two elements, then I have my tempo. major here? I don't think so. And to make it even more murky, the tenor is second, third. So both the bass and the tenor are looping. They're doing identical material for measures five and six and then the repetition for measures seven and eight. When we put this all together now, we get a beautiful blend and it's ambiguous. It's shifting tonalities. It's polytonality. And that's what Grieg, I think, does splendidly, is blending. Now this piece was written in 1866, but he was ahead of the curve. He was doing things that really nobody had done yet. And he was an enormous influence with the uh, later composers, such as uh, Debussy and Ravel. They were greatly influenced by what Grieg did. I was listening in the middle of the night last night as I go through these, these pieces take over. They really, they just own me. 
while I'm preparing for these teaching videos. And one of the Debussy preludes, The Footsteps in the Snow, is, is so much like this part right here. I'm going to redistribute here. This is essential practice, training your ears for the patterns and for the balance between the voices. They cannot be the same. We need to hear two distinct parts. Measure five. Let's do that with the single left hand as written. That's a big reach. Off. Now watch this. Augmented fourth. It drops down. Fantastic what he's doing with this. Now, all right, I'm going to show you what I'm looking at here. This is one of five PDFs that you get in your chart package. I'm giving the lesson from this one. It's the last one that I made. I love this. This is the horizontal color voice dialogue. You get this in your chart package. And you also get in your chart package four other PDFs, and you can get these as digital downloads from my website, sallychristianmusic.com. The first is the main file, and this is the entire piece with the black and white version horizontally laid out. You can learn your notes from that nice and clear. Then I went on to make what I always do, the satellite view. And this is the entire piece on the vertical axis. These pages are 11 inches by 17 inches, which is a standard size. And now, look what you see. This is the structural map of the piece. And you notice that you have systems 1, 2, 3, systems 4, 5, 6. Now you'll appreciate that all the more when I show you the color structural analysis. The same thing now, and it pops into vivid technicolor. This is probably the most important of the supplies that I make that are proprietary. I, I invented this, and almost every chart package has one of these. And I color code them. I had the first four measures of our opening material with the melodic line of the five repeated notes, the E flat pedal point in the bass, you have all of these written here. The first two measures, the second two, then we drop down without any warning into the blue box material, which I call part B. And we have the looping bass and tenor line. We have the alto that sustains E flat tonality. And then we have the yellow box part C, which is the heart and soul of where the piece is going. I did something new on this one. I took that same vertical color structural analysis and for the first time I put it on the horizontal format. And I did this because I wanted to be able to toggle back and forth with my eyes between the two part A's the two part B's back and forth and back and forth and see exactly how they are the same and how they are different. And then of course with these. And if you want to learn your piece from this, you certainly can. You just go down here on the left side like a book and the right side. That's how this works. And then the final supply, the fifth, is this voice dialogue, which I will get the lesson from. Now, I'm going to go back to the first blue box with the shifting tonalities. The parts begin to move melodically and harmonically. We hear unrest, we hear a little uh, ominousness coming. Let me play that again here, starting measure five. Now I'm going to talk about the technique now of stroking and pulling to project the melody.
lock this. We start now this time on the F with the right hand. Now this at the end is a suspension. It's E flat major. Now this is a first inversion. It's an E flat 6-3. I take that down. That's my root position, but the first inversion, but he doesn't put the E flat tonic on the bottom. He puts the dominant on the bottom. Does that sound rested? Does that sound finished? No, it doesn't. See, we're still hanging. The piece is semi concluded, but it's only half over. So he's keeping that dominant in the bass to tell you, no, we're not done yet. But how he gets to that is, I'm going to now use this. Color structural analysis because where I am in the piece is this box here. And you'll see that I have orange boxes around this and this and the similar material here and here. And what you will see in either of these, the vertical or the horizontal version, that this and this is the same. It's a suspension. Now this first one here and the second one, these are a little bit different. And if I played the first one, this is, let's start at measure nine. This is the first yellow box part C. And this is the beauty of this map, this colored map. You can start at any one of these six systems and get this as a standalone part and secure it in your fingers to know exactly where do I place my hands. Now this I'm telling you is tricky. I played it for memory and I spent months getting this memorized. It would have been easy. I could have sight read it on the first day, but to memorize it was an order of magnitude, uh, a tenfold of difficulty and time. But then you can let it go and make a creation, like an improvisation like he did when he wrote. He was always improvising. So here, starting there, measure nine, we start, and then we have this rhapsodic. And here's the first orange box. and the resolution. stroke the fingers. Everything in controlling the tone is with these fingertips. The tips are enormously sensitive. It's where we get the fine tuning of things being balanced and perfectly shaped. And then the repetition. <laughs> to here with a surprise D flat. That's a 
a flat at seventh scale degree. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven becomes we're not expecting that. Oh, this is so magnificent. If I just take the soprano and the bass, I have. here because the very last measure is a reference to the very first measure. It's identical except this bass note E flat is down here for the end of the piece instead of starting here at the beginning. He's marked pianissimo. Now this is really interesting to me. He has a diminuendo from a pianissimo and a retard and five fermatas. One, two, three, four, five. What does that tell you? Have you ever seen that in any other piece of music? I have not. This is a unique piece. He was deeply inspired when he wrote this piece. You know, it reminds me of some of the stories that I heard about him. I've done a lot of reading. I make a point of reading the biographies of the composers that I give lessons on. I get to know them. They really become my friends. And uh, one of the things about Grieg that has touched me deeply, you know, we're, we're in a really tough time now with... Uh, I'll just say this is 2020 and this is in the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic we're all going through. We've been isolated. We've been separated from our loved ones. We, the whole world is upside down now and we have to turn to something. And I turned to music. I turned to this piece. And I thought about Grieg. And I thought about respiratory problems and lung problems. And do you know when he was 17, he almost died from pleurisy and tuberculosis, and it shattered his left lung. It collapsed, and from that point on in his life, he only had one lung. Can you imagine how difficult that was? And it, it deformed his spine. His thoracic spine became terribly deformed because of that. And going through that as a 17-year-old, and, and he lived to be 64, he was always under this yoke of a, a trial, physical trial, and he transcended. He went deep into the things that he could love and find beauty and purity and truth. And he wrote this at the age of 23. Remarkable. Who's not going to be inspired by that? Deeply inspired by that. I'm going to go back to the color voice. Analysis here because I have some important distinctions that I would like to make about this on the part C's. For me, the part C's and the four orange boxes are actually the epicenter of emotions in this piece. This is where everything comes to the pivotal point. It's like in a story and your point where the plot develops and thickens and ripens happens in these orange boxes. So here we are, measure nine, the first emotional outpouring. I call these arching, closing phrases. And this starting, the A natural in the right hand. from the E flat 
to the F sharp. Now I can take E and F and get a major seventh. I can take E flat and F and get a minor seventh. And I can raise the F to an F sharp. I still just have those two pitches, F and E. And now I have a diminished seventh. I say to myself, E flat to F sharp, and I watch it. Now that's an augmented fourth, and it resolves to the sixth. Heavy, now slide on the key, and I do a really cool thing here for perfect legato. I hook my thumb, this part of the thumb, I hang on to the key, and then I grab it with the tip of the thumb and slide. Wasn't that perfect? Took years to do that. Then the next phrase that leads to the second orange box starts on the F. You have to know that. Say it. Now the F begins. Now C to E flat. powerful for you that this first part C and this is an orange box that's an orange I'm not coloring this one in orange because I'm only using these colors pink yellow and blue green for this particular PDF because I'm only showing the voice dialogue on this one but on your other supply this one those are in orange so you're going to use both of these supplies this one is very, very powerful. You just can't toggle quite as easily in learning. But I, I really, I like them both and I use them both. So I have these labels here, augmented fourth, augmented fourth, this diminished seventh, this major sixth. The second time, I'd like to compare now, this box one, two, first, yellow box and the box one two on the second yellow box and just play these you need to get these crystal clear in your mind if you're going to play this piece from memory and really understand it the first orange box measure 10 measure 12 and towards the end of the piece measure 20 And then again, measure 22, that's the same one as measure 12. So you really only have to learn three. That's really wonderful. So the soprano line, now I spent a lot of time on this. Measure nine, start on the A natural. Now E flat to F sharp. You don't want to mess that up. And it's tricky because it's unpredictable. Then start Lift the hand off, drop on the F, and then here's your major sixth. The last part A starts on the F. goes to a minor 7th C to D natural and the last one goes C to E flat I'll play the very end now Back 
and forth. Take the first one. And the lead up. Oh, now lift the pedal right there. and you need to develop the listening and the understanding of your own fingers and your hand shape. Every hand is different. There are no two alike, but there's always an answer. There's always a way to get the results you want in your playing. You just have to keep listening and record yourself. Say, do I like that? Is that lovely? <laughs> phrases. He has a little tiny slurs. I need to show you this. Right here they do have the one and two and one and two. These little tiny slurs. One and two and one and two. So you have to blend it. You have to phrase it like a singer would. Yum de yum but make it beautiful here. One more time, let's bring out this. Beautiful, tenth, octave, and sixth. Play that a lot. ago with the birth of our first granddaughter and now she's eight and uh, so this has a huge meaning for me this piece and for Greg he loved this piece so much that at the end 35 years later he wrote a companion piece called remembrances and I have a lesson on this one too and I think you'll be very interested to play the lessons on both of these pieces, the Arietta and the Remembrances, because Remembrances has everything 
that Arietta has, plus a whole nother middle section. And it's a remembrances of his life, choosing a melody that he wrote in his youth that spoke to the most delicious and wonderful time in his life. I hope this lesson has been helpful for you, and I wish you well playing your Arietta. And think of Grieg, think of people you love, think of the things that are most precious and dear to you. Anything based in love, on love, is eternal, because love is an eternal thing. It's an eternal value, and so is music. Thank you so much.